clickety clack the math dice magical math dice make the what is the thing make magical. the click clack sound make the click clack sound we're clicking and clacking oh my god got some dice asmr <laughs> for you it's just so beautiful mm. Put them all back into the bag i normally hate math but give it to me in shiny click clack rock form and i'm all about it give it to me when i'm like doing magic yeah. Or solving mysteries instead of yep. just, why does it matter that two plus two is four? I don't give a shit. Like, try to get me to budget my monthly expenses and I will cry, but if I have to cast a fireball, you bet I will count up all those sweet, sweet D6s. That's kind of what I've arrived at, is this game is competitive <laughs> math, and I've been tricked into playing competitive math, but you know yeah. what? I'm not mad about it. It's competitive math. It's critical thinking. It's an active game and critical thinking and using what, you, like, I I did the homework, I read all my spells, but what if I did this and this? Because it doesn't say I can't do that. What if? DM, can I do that? Today we are talking about uh, The Tale as Old as Time, the game that uh, predates all of us, uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And I suppose role-playing games in general will feature widely in this conversation but we all play them um they're a good time and if there's something you're not interested in just skip this episode and if it's something you are interested stay tuned uh you might learn something i'm fairly new to it um and i've recently gotten into a lot of different things that are that kind of double as learning tools. So um, it is possible. If you're afraid, if you're intimidated, it can happen for you. I like to think of it as uh, it's a role playing game. So you kind of you make it up as you go. But it's kind of easier to think about it as all the player people. There's there's people who are playing characters and there's a dungeon master, a game master who's controlling the narrative. So it's kind of like you are playing the the players are playing characters in a book and they're in full control of their actions, but the dungeon master is in control of the narrative. And all, but you also roll dice to see, like if I say like, well, I want to jump up onto that table. Uh, okay. The dungeon master would be like, okay, uh, roll your dice to see if you do that. And you have a sheet that tells you if you are good at jumping on tables or bad at jumping on tables. And then you roll to see if you, you roll to see if you do well or bad at that. And then the narrative continues based on how well you jump on that table or not. It's like I like those to... choose your own adventure books from back in the day, except there's someone making up the story as you, as you go along, because I mean, we all like to think that dungeon masters plan out elaborate sessions and have them go perfectly, but it's usually more like they spend hours and hours and hours planning a session and then the players go in a completely different direction. It's, and then you to have to me, make it all up. Right. And to me, for that reason, it's sort of like extra structured improv. Yeah. And the kind, the type of this that I really like is more the theater of the mind stuff. Like it's good to have maps and, I think those help, especially for combat, but it's the kind of thing that I think really lends itself to like thinking creatively on your feet, both for a DM and for a player, but I've only yes. played as a player, so I don't, Terr I can't really speak to that. DM. I don't like, someone's like, don't you want to? Like, you know the rules decently. And I was like, no, a DMing sounds terrifying to me. I've There's done so many rules. both <laughs> and I'm still more comfortable as a player because... DMing is scary. Uh, you, you it just I when I DM I feel like I need to know everything, but I don't because there's just so many rules and it's not like it, it says it's it says so in the player's handbook itself or in the DM guide. I can't remember which one. It says like these rules are more like guidelines than you know actual rules. The whole point of the game is that you have fun. Which is a nice sentiment, but then when you get to the down to the technicality of things, you're just like, ah, oh, um, I'm going to take uh, cover behind this rock. How much cover is this? Is this full cover? Is it half cover? Is it three quarters cover? How much damage is negated by three quarters cover? That becomes too much math, and then my brain hurts. 
Well, also, there's also the difference of like I'm terrified of becoming so. There's some that's called like a, a rules lawyer. That's like a negative aspect of knowing trying to break. Well, the rules say. Let me push up my glasses. The rules say that. Oh, those those guys in the min maxers are the worst. And like I'm terrified of becoming because I I I'm terrified of becoming that person because I'm like, well, I looked all this stuff up, so I want to like utilize the rules and also like double back and use the wording they didn't use against it want to play with it like the the constraints of it all (laughs) right it's always pushing those boundaries yeah Yeah. my my first encounter encounter my first campaign that i ever did was made up of me uh two rules lawyers and two min maxers and the dm was a rules lawyer himself and it was just exhausting i'm like how is this fun what part of this is fun (laughs) this is too much and everyone's yelling at each other yeah, I but mean, I've if you spend played... the bigger part of the game just arguing, that's not fun. That's just, that's it's not, it's not fun. I also played a game, because I told my friends, because I, I'm sure we'll talk about Critical Role eventually, but I was, I finally, I was playing, I finished the first campaign of Critical Role, took me a good, like, year, and <laughs> I finished it. And I was like, I want to play. I want to play. I want to play. I want to play. But nobody we knew played. But one of my friends was like, I will learn from my bro. I'll work with my brother and we will create a, a, a one shot. And I was like, hooray. But then it turned out she just asked her brother like two questions and then she she made up something, which was a fun adventure. We fought Medusa. We shouldn't have because we're level one people. But <laughs> She also didn't know what she was doing to the point of like, you encounter a bunch of bad guys and we're like, okay, we rolled. And she's like, oh, I didn't roll for these guys. My brother told me to roll for every encounter you might have, but I thought that was dumb. So I didn't do it. And I was like, this is why. And also like, she'll do some stuff like somebody cast detect magic and she's like, well, you know this, but you don't know the type of magic. And my brain is going spell specifically says you know the type of magic but i'm like don't say anything don't be that person don't do that she put a lot of work into it but my brain was like i would be mad if i lost the spell slot because i did the thing it specifically says in the book i can do Mm -hmm. it's hard it's hard and it's really hard when the dm who is trying really hard is your loving boyfriend of 10 years and (laughs) you're sitting (laughs) So that's what we're dealing with now. That's It's a group that is basically the original group that I played with, but now Steve's the DM, and it's his first time DMing, and it's hard. It's fucking hard to DM, and I think that it's just a lot of moving parts, and he's very detail-oriented, so he's having... Oof, this is rough it, for detail-oriented people. <laughs> it's rough, and I it's hard for me to critique at all because I've never done it. And I think that, I think that when I eventually DM, I'm going to be more detail oriented about the world building and not so much each specific encounter. Yeah. Um, Cause it's, it, again, the fun of it comes out of the improv, but you have to be able to improv within those really specific rules. Um, so if I may sidetrack into like, just the nuts and bolts here for a sec um dungeons and dragons commonly abbreviated as d ampersand d or d lowercase n d um is a fantasy tabletop role-playing game originally designed by wizards of the coast um gary gygax and dave arneson back in the day 1974 it was first published by tactical studies rules inc um It's been around for years and years and years, and it was the first one that spawned all different kinds. There are similar games out there. Pathfinder um, is the one that comes to my mind. I just saw one. (laughs) What the heck? There's Um, also a whole bunch of like Monster. It's like Monster of the Week, I think, is a newer one. I'm listening to a, a Let's Play podcast that's Monster of the Week. And also you can just create a world that just uses the D&D mechanics because... Yeah, yeah and that's not? what a lot of people do. It's it's sort of like a, a base structure, but you can apply rules and characteristics to a different universe. Like, it doesn't have to be high fantasy. That's the original, but it could be like space and uh, space, other settings. <laughs> it's uh, it's early. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think... I think it's the adventure zone. There, there's, I've seen a couple. Oh, Dimension 20 does it like, oh, hey. Like, I'm listening to Dimension 20 thing that's like, oh, hey, uh, we're in, you're in school. You're not an adventure. You're learning how to be adventurers. You're in high Cute. school right now. 
Oh I my god, it's so anime. <laughs> I love it. Um, Magical girl school. I'm so into it. I, I would play that. So, I mean, maybe it'll help clear up what the game is if we talk a little bit about our current campaigns or our characters right now. I well, can go. Or Ava can go. I think Ava's played technically the longest. I think Ava uh, has the most experience. P- 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 possibly. Um, but Ava did, cur- you know, leave her most recent campaign. Um, so I'm currently without one, but I am set to pick back up in October with a friend's homebrew campaign that is based on an DM's Guild homebrew setting. Um based on like an oriental setting like ancient japan china kind of um so that's gonna be a thing that's gonna be fun can't wait because he's a really good dm and a really good storyteller we did a campaign based on that ages ago yeah super fun um when i played with him last in that campaign setting i started with a bard who was basically school of the geisha and that was fun, but then she died. And oh, then no. yeah. how did she die? Um oh god, how did she die? I think we were attacked by a pack of rabid wolves or something. I can't remember. We were still very low level, but she died. It was very tragic. I think I rolled a natural one in light, like my second death save, and they couldn't get back to me. Oh big yeah. Oof. yeah, yeah. Um they did eventually come back and bury me. Because I was super. Uh. Nice. Um, <laughs> yeah, womp womp indeed. But then I rolled a uh, backup character, and she was a warlock, and her patron was a uh, was an ancient sea serpent, which was fun because that sea serpent was responsible for our party's fighters' um, backstory. He was in uh, uh, the Royal Navy. And he had ended up losing his entire crew to that sea serpent. So his mission in life was basically to seek revenge upon that sea serpent. And then my new character rocks on and her patron is that sea serpent. And I was like, hey, (laughs) drama. (laughs) This is my my area. What you doing? Yeah. Unfortunately, we never we never got we, we never got to get to that point where they realized like, oh, shit, this is the thing. You know, they he didn't know that her that she was a warlock because basically the thing that defined like the, she had, you know, sometimes uh, they, people take on like traits of their patron. And I think for that uh, patron of the sea serpent, you had to have like a, it was kind of like um, the sorcerer. Uh, Sorceress Origin Dragonborn or uh, the Dragon the Draconic Bloodline, you show like signs of that sea serpent. And hers was that, I think it was her left eye was like a yellow serpent's eye. And she always kept that hidden under an eye patch. So they didn't know that she was a warlock because she had Pact of the Hexblade as well. So she was, uh, she always used her weapon and her magic was. You know, she tried to avoid using it because she was still very new to the whole warlock pact. And she was like, ah, this is weird. I'm used to using weapons. I don't know about this whole magic shenanigans thing. So unfortunately, they never got to the point where they because they started like getting really close and like really close. And yeah, we never got to the drama of it, unfortunately, which is a shame because I was really looking forward to that. Um, but that was a super fun campaign, but then it just sort of, um, like fizzled out, you know, the way it sometimes happens, people have to skip sessions for reasons and then some people stop showing up and then there's just two players left and that's not enough to run a campaign and Mm -hmm. yeah, it's sad. It's sad. I, I definitely fall into that. Like I'm going to create a character and I have all these plans for a story kind of like how i play the sims honestly and then i just (laughs) go all in and either the campaign falls apart or we just stop playing but luckily i'm in mint two right now that are actually like holding up pretty well despite the pandemic so traditionally dungeons and dragons is something that's played in person it's it's because it's like live action it's not live action role play. That's LARP. That's another thing. I wonder if anyone <laughs> on the team LARPs because that's a whole nother episode. 
Um, but it's it's very, you know, in person um, traditionally. And now with the pandemic, that's a lot harder. But fortunately, technology, the use of technology has saved, it's actually made certain campaigns of ours better, I think. Um, because two, in, in one of our campaigns, there's a, a couple who has kids and they're able to like have bath time, but still like be on their headsets and still be talking through and, you know, like getting you know, trading off, like getting ready for bed. It's like their character goes and takes a short rest while they're putting their child to bed and like can't talk on the mic. So it's, it's interesting. There's a lot of tools that we can talk about that are available um, Mm -hmm. that can Um, help you have a game online. Fun fact. uh, If it hadn't been for those online tools, uh, Auntie Ava never would have been able to play D&D because as you all know, I live in a Dutch speaking country. And I had, like, one option or two options to join IRL campaigns, but they would all be in Dutch, and one of them was even in my local dialect. And I don't know if any of you are familiar familiar with Dutch or my local dialect, but it doesn't really lend itself to an immersive fantasy setting because Dutch is a garbage language. What? So I don't know. I don't it know. is. I haven't heard any of it. Maybe if I heard some of it right no, now, I could judge no, no. That's a that's a good Maybe. try, Caitlin. But no, um, <laughs> I can send you guys some you some links to YouTube videos of people speaking Dutch. That that might work. Oh dear God, the gremlins are awake. Hi. I've heard Ava speak in her native language like twice. <laughs> Every time, I'm just like maybe if I heard some more, but I could judge. Maybe uh, Julia's ha- heard me have full conversations in Dutch, and uh, what was what? What did she compare it to again? Um, Russian and Scottish while drunk had a baby. <laughs> I need to hear it. <laughs> That's my local dialect. It's um, just so stunning that your accent, your when speaking English, your accent is so like non-existent uh, so american or just like if you had like a british something it would make it's, a little bit more sense it's because it i it's because i grew up consuming uh american media like i grew up with dragon ball z the simpsons like, step by step like stuff Kunisit. yeah pretty That's much she did too pretty much uh i can i i'm very quick at picking up accents which is handy in D as well because i can i once did an entire campaign with like a uh, uh, Eastern European accent because I was playing a tiefling and I had some some inspiration from Laura Bailey when she was playing Jester. <laughs> My name is Jasper. She's is Jester. I'm super cute. Thank you for asking. I'm yes. a little blue tiefling and I love her so much. <laughs> I have a pretty blue um, dress. I try. I can't do accents for long for a long time. I have one character that I made with. So I the friend who decided to dive deep in for me and just go on and dm first and not play first she found a um i think it's called what is the adventure league where you can go to like a comic book shop and there are this was back in the olden times when you could go to stores um you could go to a comic book shop and like once a week the comic book shop would host a DD game and it would be uh people who like who signed up there's like somebody who dms and people who show up and they play a game and she found that and she found a store near her that did that. So she started playing with them. And then pandemic hit. And I guess that group decided they were going to do Curse of Strahd, which is a book a planned. It's a pre-made game. So the DM has this book to work off of for the for the tale. But she was like, do you want to join? And I was like, yes, I want to join. Thank you very much. And we made characters. But she's like, let's have accents. And I was like, I can't do jack shit. I'm not talented in the accent department. So, but she's like, well, can you do anything? And I was like, I can only kind of do this one because of gesture and also stroganoff somehow is my centro word for it. If it goes wayward, I can say stroganoff (laughs) and it'll bring it right back in. So we were a pair of twins because of course you're, you're playing D&D. You must have a pair of twins. It's just how you do. It's mandatory. It's the rules. Yeah. Well, it is, like, story-wise and, like, campaign-wise, it is a good reason of, like, these two people don't want to leave each other, and it's because they're related, and they, like, it's a good, like, reason to keep two characters linked without much work (laughs) involved. But it's the only one that I do an accent for, because I can't really do accents, 
because they don't stay if they i do pull one off they don't stay long they'll end up just teetering out but unless i have one like oh i can strogan off and i can center this one this one one or if it's a southern one i can say oh how bless your heart isn't that sweet or just some kind of phrase can like that was a very Eastern European, oh, bless your heart, oh, but- <laughs> just now. <laughs> <laughs> Won't work. For a while, when I was listening to, when I was d- going through um, Assassin's Creed, I could do the, Ita- whatever, I can do Ezio's Italian. I could kind of do Italian because I was playing it so much, but it's not, <laughs> it's not there anymore because I haven't listened to it. I, I am a di- divine soul in that. I'm a divine soul sorcerer in that. Oh, those are I, fun. Well, my sister is a grave cleric. So, life and death, love it. Yeah. When I like devoutness and mine, like just like I don't know, I just like (laughs) I kind I got powers. I don't really know why, but there is like she's lawful though. So like there's dead and there's not dead. That's all I know. I'm helping. I'm here to keep you not dead. Let's get. Uh, Love a support class. Twin haste. uh, Twin haste. I once when I played uh, that campaign, it was with the DM who's who dm'd that um oriental campaign and he he and i were players in that other campaign and he played a cleric who didn't who was very reluctant to heal like he would heal you but he would bitch about it all the time and he did this outrageous french accent and it was just (laughs) uh, he had like these slightly like gay undertones as well his uh this was Mind you, this was a campaign where we went like balls to the wall ham. His spiritual weapon was a giant dildo. And it was, of course, it was, of course, insane. But he was so much fun. (laughs) Oh, God, I can't remember. It was, uh, I think it was homebrew as well. Um, But it was in that kind of like, we were in that stage where. The DM had gotten a new girlfriend and she had joined and he uh-huh. was like, he mm-hmm. was like, you know, letting her do all kinds of shit that normally wouldn't fly because, mm. you know, yeah, no, 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 you can do it. You can do whatever you want. And then we were like, well, fuck you then. So we set fire to his library and then we noped out of the game. <laughs> <laughs> and some amount of that, like leeway is good when you're learning, but mm-hmm. when it's an yeah. uneven distribution of there's a difference between like uh, letting someone do a something because player. they're learning, and then you know letting them get away with everything, and then letting us do nothing. Because normally at my table, I always utilize the rule of cool. Like, if you want to do something that's technically against the rules, but I think it's awesome, I'm going to let you do it. I and like the Matt Mercer rule of, like, I'm let, I'm going to let you roll for it. Yeah. Let's see if you let's see Exactly. If you roll high. <laughs> like, I'm going to let you try. And we were coming up with these strategies, and we, we couldn't even roll for it. He was just like, no. Just no. And we're like, okay, like, can we, like, make a dexterity check for it or, like, roll for strength? Like, no, it's not going to work. Don't do it. And like, oh, okay. So no matter what we did, like, none of our like, our strategies or our tactics or whatever, like, we couldn't try anything. So we basically just sat there and did damage when we could. And otherwise, there was nothing we could do. But meanwhile, his new girlfriend was like, oh, I wonder if I could try to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Roll for it. And we were just like, fuck you. So, yeah, fire library done. So, like, can I ask from a player perspective, Ava, as the DM, like, what (laughs) when someone is asking to, like, give something a try or do a creative uh, method of solving a problem? Like, what does that mean for the DM? And that's a really broad, like, ask, but... Sort of, I guess to rephrase the question, if that were happening to you in this DM that you don't like, who was just kind of saying like, no, 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 like what what would that mean from the from your perspective as a DM? Like, I guess how would you have handled that? Um, if I were the DM who was constantly saying no, the thing when I'm in the DM seat, I try to let them try everything i very rarely say no because this is a game where absolutely everything is possible because in the last campaign i was in um a one like our druid literally just used create water to drown a mimic by creating water inside the mimic so anything is possible 
That's um, amazing. I love it so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, because also it's within the rules. It's a contained thing. So exactly. <laughs> that is why. Like, if there is nothing in the rules that specifically black on white says no, this is not possible. I'm not going to be quick to say no. I'm going to just assess the situation um, and see if you do this, could this possibly kill you? Like if there's a large chance that it might either like cause a TPK or cause a player death or whatever, I am going to very strongly advise against it. Like I'm going to point out like you can try, but it's probably not going to end well. And then it's up to them to decide if they still want to try it or no. Um, and then I just make sure that, you know, they roll for it. And I set an appropriate DC. Um, if it's like, um, they want to open a door and that's going to like lead them somewhere they're not supposed to go yet. Cause I don't know, it's too high level or somewhere in the story where they're, they, they can't go or it's, it's just like too far off. The, oh, oh the- and a DC for newbie people or DC is if I roll a die, the DC is the number I have to beat to yes. succeed on the thing. So yes. if it takes me, if I want to jump on the table and Ava sets a DC of 11, I have to roll, is it 11 and above? Yes, 11 or above. In order to do it. If I roll a 10, I probably hurt my knee or something. Yeah. So if if their, if their ploy is basically like, we want to try to get through this door and that door leads them to like the end boss, I'm going to go, okay, fine. Uh, try to open the door, roll, I don't know, uh, roll for um, sleight of hand, I think it is, to pick locks. Um, and I'm going to set a DC like 30. And that's like a relatively <laughs> high one. That's very, very, very difficult to get. But it still, you know, gives them that chance and they're going to roll. They're obviously going to fail. But at least they'll be like, oh, you know, we tried. It's not an option. We'll move on. Instead of just flat out saying, no, you can't do it. I'm going to let them try. But I'm also, you know, going to set, I'm either going to try and discourage them from doing it by just simply telling them if you, you know, you do this, you might possibly get killed or implying that. Or I'm going to set a DC that they're probably not going to make. Can I tell a quick story about something that we did Do it. with one of So we were, my, the campaign, I'm, I'm doing a campaign with my two sisters and, uh, and two other people. And my sister's DMing and it's Dungeon of the Mad Mage. This is actually the first character I ever created was for this campaign. She's a knowledge cleric named Gilly Weatherby. She's very terrified to be here. Um, but we opened a door and it had like this huge like we had been dungeon crawling for at like for a while and so we were kind of like i was a little like the spellcasters were a little low on spells like it was just like end of the day kind of like thing and we opened a door and there was this giant monster in there and my sister was like okay what do you like she had us roll for initiative and then like i went and i was like i'm just gonna shut the door and then dash away <laughs> can i do that we we can't fight this thing right now so we're just like we opened it went oh shit and then just shut the door and left because the thing never didn't notice us so we're like we don't want to deal with this right now nope and then we shut it and left <laughs> which is also an option yep yeah no that's a good one but then we went we we went another route and we found another way to like it was because it's it's a set game the other route we took also took us to the same monster. So we're like, well, fuck. I guess we're fighting this thing. <laughs> From Kinda another angle. To then. Oh, God. That's how we ended up fighting a zombie beholder when we were, like, level three in our last campaign. I just kept going, like, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe, maybe don't. But they were all, like, but it's a, the big dangerous thing is going to be guarding all the best loot. It's like, we're not here for loot. We're here to rescue somebody. But the best I'm loot. Mildly- I will say, so I'm I'm playing in two, I technically have three games. One is a homebrew, two are games from set modules, so Curse of Strahd and Dungeon of the Mad Mage are the two I'm working off of, or work I'm in right now. The loot drop is atrocious. For Dungeon of the Mad Mage, we're getting silver. We're not, like, we're not getting gold. We're getting wow. silver and copper. We've barely found, like, I haven't, I found, like, a wand, like, a wand that opens secret doors, but that's it. 
and it's like we're not getting anything and it's just like i just like i didn't want a lot of stuff but i wanted something and like we've even brought it up to my sister of like can we get more loot like i know it's not like are we like we had to ask are we just failing looking for shit and she's like no there's just no loot in this book like there's not a lot of stuff because i guess this edition of dungeons and dragons are trying to get away from having as much loot as there has been in the past i guess but i was like but i want magical weapons yep (laughs) i want all the shiny things i want to be rich and i want magical weapons and i just feel like i want better things than what i have i think oh i do have boots of haste which is good because i'm a half i'm a halfling so oh yeah less speed (laughs) because i think my sister even in her rare moments of my sister's as a dm is pretty cagey she won't let anything get away but she did like go Maybe you should give those to the healer. Maybe the healer should get the fast boots, because the rogue kept trying to take everything. So. Uh, yeah, we had a we had that same problem in uh, my last campaign when it was like whenever we defeated something, it was always the same two people who immediately went, "I check for loot," and then kept everything, even though it was something that, you know, was clearly meant for another player. They just kept it, and then they sold it, and then they used the gold to buy stuff for themselves, and that kind of uh, me. Yeah, there is also, because also the first game I ever played that was the game with uh, the girl who also didn't know how to play, but tried for my birthday to, I feel really bad, <laughs> but she tried for my birthday to make a one-shot, so it was a bunch of people who didn't really know how to play, and right. only by my knowledge of watching other people play did I know how it worked. That's the only, I hadn't actually played it, played it, but there was a person at the table who decided to play a rogue and she decided when we were fighting the big boss at the end that her character wouldn't fight. Like she was just going to hide. And we, at some point we had to turn to her and go, at some point you're showing you don't like the people at the table. Your actions, yeah. like it might be in, in quote unquote in character for you, but at some point you're not defending the people at the table, your friends, and you need to do that. And yep. I don't know if it was because she was uncomfortable in the fighting aspect, like she didn't know how to do it and she didn't want to ask to like to how to how to do the fighting math, which is perfectly like I understand why people get confused about that because it's a lot oh, of yeah. math and it's so a lot, but she just decided, nope, it's my character. My character would hide at this moment. And Props to my first, my friend who's never played Dungeons and Dragons for her initiative to be like, the snakes take an action to smell you out and attack you. No, they're going to find, no, you're fighting. Yeah. <laughs> I had to do the same thing at some point during a one shot because I had someone who made a rogue that was kind of like based on a ninja and they had this. Uh, Everybody like, who plays rogues. Like, what is yeah. it? I don't know, but they had like this uh, this mechanic where they could hide in the shadows. Like if they if there were shadows, they could like warp two shadows. I think it was with a, cl- a combination of like magical items and then abilities or whatever. And uh, they were using that ability during like the big boss fight at the end to just completely stay out of sight, like just constantly stay out of sight and let the warlock, uh, not the warlock, the the cleric. I can't remember what the other one was playing, but take all the damage. And I was like, right, listen here, you little shit. And then I just created, uh, just used my DM powers to say, and now there's a fog rolling in and all of the shadows are obscured. There's nothing casting a shadow now. Oh no, you can't hide. (laughs) Like you're not, you're not going to do that. Fuck you. Do something. Um, I, I have players that, you know, ultimately, aren't quite yet understanding that this is a cooperative game yeah. yep <laughs> it's yep. it's hard and and i think it's because so my group that i'm playing with that is very much competitive like we play board games i mean we used to before the dark times um play board games we're competitive with each other but D D is different it's you're com- you have to be competitive against yourself and competitive against the environment. It's PVE, not PVP, and not everyone gets that. Um, and I think they're starting to in my one uh, campaign that it's it's tough. It's tough. That was um, that was also something that we had. 
uh, trouble with in the last campaign. Like, it was fun, but it was like a bunch of beginners. Uh, like, a, a, a lot of new players. And one of them was like, I'm going to be the healer. She was a druid. And she was like, I'm going to heal everyone. And then she never healed anyone. Oh, honey, no. Like, in one fight, our paladin went down three times. And she was standing right next to him. And we were like, oh. get, the, get the paladin up. And then she attacked okay cool she managed to kill the mimic by drowning him with create water but like the paladin is bleeding out right at your feet you're our only healer because you wanted to be the healer nobody else healed or took a healer class because you said you were going to be the healer and she never did she just went for the attacks and we were kind of like we don't want to push you into the healing role but if you're going to tell if you're telling us that you're going to heal don't let someone bleed out at your feet you know as I think it was kind of cornered into because my first my first campaign campaign that I made was with my two older my two sisters and uh, two other people and I listened too much to my older sister who was like gosh it'd be real great if we had a cleric huh and I was always like, oh I guess I could be like she didn't take it <laughs> but I guess like me baby was like I could be a cleric I suppose I could heal but then my first when I made her I didn't I rolled good for my stats, but I also didn't understand what I should be doing with it. And thankfully, my my twin sister, who is DMing, recently let me change up her stats and kind of... I'm a, still a halfling, but I'm a different kind of halfling now, so my stats could be rearranged so I could be more... So did better. you gain or lose weight? <laughs> Were you a, I gained, a stout I gained, half? <laughs> I gained weight. I made a... She was a the lightfoot halfling. So Because I was like, oh, charisma. Because you need charisma. But I was yeah. like, but also she's a knowledge cleric and she doesn't necessarily need to be good at everything. It was mainly like I wasn't efficient in fights. I was easily yeah. knocked down. You could hit me twice. I'd go down. My AC wasn't very good. So I put a bunch of stuff in. Like I didn't need to be good at charisma because she's, right. she's a knowledge cleric. She spent a lot of her time reading books. She really doesn't need to be. She's her- a nerd. She doesn't have to be like a cool nerd. Yeah. It's, and, like, it's hard. Also, the new person shouldn't be the one who solely... Everybody else rolled low charisma characters. Everybody else who had played before. Oh. So the new person had to be like, you're our front line, go. And I was like, what am I asking? <laughs> what am I yeah. doing? I got put in situations where I was like, I don't want... I don't... What do you want me to do? Like, And then I'd ask it wrong. And I'd be like, I don't know. And they'd be like, no, 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 no. And I was like, I don't know. Or... One of the other players was like, I have this idea and you can go tell them my idea. And I was like, it's your fucking idea. Don't make me tell them. I don't even want to do this idea. No, it's your yeah. fucking idea. But you go do it because you have the high charisma. Like, that's not that's not no. fair. That's why my advice for anyone starting is first time players should not be the face character. The, you know, the, nope. the talker, the front man. Yep. And first time players should not be support characters like um you know your healer or uh, honestly first time players should just be fighters (laughs) is my like number one advice druids and clerics i say are super mean to new players because clerics have act both druids and clerics have access to all their spells almost all the time it's just you can only cast a certain number like you can switch them out daily that's way too many to learn and way too much it's a lot and it's a lot to manage and druids can turn into other animals, which is super cool, but then that's a different stat block. <laughs> oh my <laughs> god, and it's so... Know. I think I play... I forget if I played a ranger or a druid first, like my very first first character, because I oh, was also, like, animals! <laughs> yeah, ranger's also bad, because then also the beastmaster ranger, the ranger with the pet is not very fun to play yep, after a while. It's not. The pet, like, it's not optimized right. Like, it's really... The DM has to fix a lot of the, the pet stuff. Yeah, and Steve, right now we have a, a ranger who is, he's kind of pulling in some elements from 3.5, which is uh, edition 3 or edition 3.5, which is like older editions of the game because they update the mechanics every couple of years. And he is adjusting the the metrics for the ranger that we're playing with. Because I do have a, I have a gnome ranger, but I did, my DM was like, do you want to be like a beast master? And I was like, no, (laughs) no, I'm like, it's too much extra work, A, and B, like, there's a lot of, there's a unearthed arcana stuff that's not official, it's not an official class, but it is online that I can pull all the stuff from. It's called the Fey Wanderer, 
mm-hmm. uh, one. And so I get stuff like Misty Steps so I can like teleport around. <laughs> and this character, her name is Bank Timbers. She's a gnome and she's pretty much just drunk Caitlin at her peak. Like she just Yes. <laughs> I love her. She just she just like, are we shooting things? Hooray! Or like we you could jump down or you could climb down. Like, I don't know. Can I boing? And like, I'm gonna boing. Is this door locked? I'm going in. That's just all she is. And I was like, I don't need a pet. I don't need to take care of that. Yeah, no, no responsibility. <laughs> I so like to solve for my because so the the campaign one of the two campaigns we're playing right now was like my first jump back into it well no that's not true one of the two campaigns we're playing now um i had picked classes that i thought were interesting i have a bard that's in a campaign that we've since like put not put to sleep but it's on it's on hiatus right now just because of everything that's going on um and we can't meet but this other campaign we started it's it's some of the same people um switch the dm uh i basically said like look i want the least complicated set of stats that i can have make me a barbarian um and like i just want to smash stuff and i kind of went into it with the thought process of like i'm a button masher when it comes yeah, to yeah, like yeah. new video games <laughs> right so like the button masher equivalent in D is your barbarian um i just i want i monk is good too but i wanted something that like i i love magic i eventually want to do something with magic but i was like no no magic just straight fighting um which with barbarian eventually you can do some things i think especially i think they're they're introducing this like subclass about like wild magic where you can like roll the dice but basically i just i wanted to build a character that was very simple and i think with in in building a character that has simple stats you can you can play more with the role play aspect of it um to kind of get your feet wet so um Radagund Baliach is my Ooh. half orc. Yeah, my half orc um, barbarian who was raised hum- raised by humans, but left to learn the ways of orcish fighting. Um, and her her accent basically is a little bit of grog strong jaw, but originally inspired by uh, Anna of Cleves the from thing. Six the Musical. Yes, <laughs> yes. But I have noticed, and so has Steve, that since I started watching Critical Role, that it has gotten a little low and and sounds a little (laughs) like Grog's sister. But it really was like this, like, all right, here's what we're doing. And it, like, very, like, Cockney British, um, just, like, take no shit. Um, But she's super fun, and I get to smash things, but when I'm... I take my turn. I know the like four things that I can do right now. Yep. And I pick one of those things and I, I add the flair of like, I, you know, I smash in his head or, like, cause I, cause we have a DM for that campaign that really lets us play um, in terms of like play around with, with the improving and the, the theater of the mind type of stuff. Um, so that has really helped me. That's like my biggest piece of advice. Like that has helped me like, okay, I know in terms of the game mechanics, what my abilities are. I know I can stick to that and explore a little bit. Um, and then I do my turn and then I listen because everybody else has really complex like magic users and they know what they're doing and, and they just go for it. And I'm like, also like at the same time looking up their stats and like okay what can they do um so that's been a really good like education um and then my character for my other campaign is uh marigold green bottle and she's got a bit of an irish accent that oftentimes Ooh. slips uh but she's very flowery and she's a little stout half elf who is a who is a druidic healer uh most of the time and most of the time she doesn't really know what's going on but she's very cute um <laughs> So that's... I love her so much. I do have. So I do think I. I, told, I think I told Ava this idea. I have a vague idea because a bunch of the people in the Strad game are talking. They're starting a new game for their adventure league thing, so they were all talking about making characters. And I was like, I can just fuck around on D and D Beyond. And I thought about like, what if there was a gnome barbarian who was just because I was like, that's funny. And now that's I hilarious. Want, I just want to play a gnome barbarian because <laughs> just like a I'll, tiny angry. Angry little, you stepped on my flowers. (laughs) 
Hey, hey, <laughs> get back here. <laughs> you crush my flowers, I crush your kneecaps. Cause tiny, <laughs> tiny rage. Love her. And also, like, I made it and I didn't realize at the time. Because there's sometimes you get you get to roll dice twice and take advantage on certain situations right. based on what race you are. And gnomes get advantage on saving throws from magic effects. And I was like, oh, this is secretly, this is outwardly hilarious, but secretly mm-hmm. actually beneficial. Ooh, so good. I'm going to hold on to you, little little gnome barbarian. I don't, you don't have a name yet. But you will someday. And, like, that's the other, like, piece of advice that I would give. Like, build based on the way you want to play. I feel like min-maxers, and again, I play with them. I live with one. I know you. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's all about, like, optimizing, like, the spells and skills that you take for combat. But, like, sometimes I don't really care about combat. Sometimes I want to play a character that can be really creative in problem solving or, you know, sing their way out of a situation. And that really depends on the DM. If the DM is more combat focused, then maybe pick something that's optimized for combat. But it's, it's hard, I think, sometimes to play and try to be creative and feel like you're not fucking over the DM who's like, all right, well, I plan for this. And <laughs> now, not now and now you're making a bush come alive? Like, I don't... Okay, fine. <laughs> like, God bless my patient, patient boyfriend who is DMing for the first time and dealing with me trying to, like, make friends with every plant and squirrel. We got, for the Dungeon of the Mad Mage, there was one point, because my twin sister's boyfriend is playing with us, and he's played for a long time. Both my twin sister and my and her boyfriend know like multiple versions of the game are in their head so sometimes we have to remind them they're like that's not a rule for this version that we're playing you're thinking of an old rule that's why we got confused but he got mad because it used to be like you couldn't just befriend everybody sometimes like we found an orc that was like trapped in a spider web and me and my other sister saved him and like brought him to a safe spot and like sent him on his way and he got mad he was like we should have just killed him like, I don't understand. It's like, we didn't have to, though. And then he immediately got attacked by three giant spiders. So, we're staying behind. But it's just like, you don't have to fight everything. You could, some things will fight you no matter what. But sometimes you don't have to. It's always worth a try to talk it out. That's why it's always handy to have um, a session zero at the beginning of the campaign as well. It's a good... Uh, option to get together with the DM and the rest of the players, the DM can get a sense of what you want from the campaign. Like the way we do it is like, all right, do you want to focus on combat? Like, do you want dungeon crawl after dungeon crawl? Or do you want to have more role play? Like, do you want to go through a campaign full of political intrigue and you want to talk yourself Mm -hmm. out of situations? Or do you want a mix of both? And then based on what the consensus there is, um, especially if you're with new players as well, it's handy. So like say everybody wants combat, then the DM can sort of help them create characters that are optimized for combat. Yeah, I actually made, my knowledge cleric was actually made for the, um, before the Dungeon of the Mad Mage, there's like a one through five thing where it's, it's like Dragon Heist that Matt Mercer also helped create. But it's like it's a heist. You're, you're. I don't know exactly. I we never finished it because my my sister who was new at DMing, that was too much for her. Like it was too much of like I don't know who you know. Like there was confusion about who we knew in the city and who didn't because she didn't like. There was just confusion, so we just jumped to the dun- dungeon crawl part of it. But I made a knowledge cleric because she'd be super useful in a heist because she can just divine. I can make an arcade. I can read thoughts with divine and like with my channel divinity i can just look at you and then cast suggestion and make you go do it she's super useful in a heist not so useful in a dungeon crawl (laughs) the six languages doesn't really come up that i know in the dungeon crawl that's why it's so not advised for new players to go with things like clerics or druids or anything that has access to their full library of spells because you have to prep those spells in the morning, which means that you have to sort of be able to anticipate the situation no. that you're going to 
end up in like if you're if you're gearing up to say we're going to infiltrate somewhere and we got to be sneaky then it's maybe good to stock up on some support maybe see if you can have some pass without a trace or maybe you have some uh you know uh, some friend spells or suggestion spells stuff like that mm-hmm. if you're yeah. you know if you know you're going into rough combat then maybe have like a good balanced uh palette of healing spells and offensive spells and attack spells because my my cleric is not she's not optimized like she especially wasn't then like she's not good in a fight now she like you could hit her twice she'd be gone now she is she's much better now but at the time i didn't she was all over the place so she wasn't particularly good at one thing (laughs) yeah i that was my my very very first character still my favorite is colleen she's a half elven sorceress of stormborn which is still my favorite class of sorcerer. It's so much fun. But she was basically a walking glass cannon. Like, you, she could fucking melt the flesh off your face in, like, 0.5 seconds. But if you so much as sneezed on her, she was dead. So it, it was very much trying to figure out, right, how can I deal maximum damage but still stay far enough away from the source of the hurt? Um, and then I also realized, like, I had to, then when I leveled up, change some spells around, because I realized, right, I, it's handy to be able to cast from afar, but sometimes something is gonna come near me, and then I need to be able to get away, so I started, instead of going full offense, I started investing in things like Misty Step, or Haste, or stuff like that, because it, if you, when you start this game, it's super fun, but you're not going to be an optimal player yet. You're not going to know your class no matter how many times like, or how long you spend studying your spells and the rules and everything. You're not going to really get a feel for it until you really get into playing. That's when you really get to know your class. And then it helps, you know, when you level up that you can tweak it a little bit. If you come to the conclusion that, you know, maybe the class I picked Maybe not for me. That's fine. Talk to your DM. See if you can change class. I've been in campaigns where people, um, you know, agreed with the DM. Okay, we'll let my character die and bring in a backup. Or we just, you know, keep the character but completely change the class. If your DM's okay with it, that's fine. And, you know, if you're DMing a campaign for beginners, then I personally, at least, would be understanding of that fact. Because you know, there was nothing worse than playing having to like finish a campaign with a character that you don't enjoy playing because it's all about you having fun that's the most important thing if you're having fun you're doing it right for sure and there's also like yeah because my sister actually because i was frustrated with um my cleric for like a second and she offered to for the switch for a while and i was like no i made her i don't want to like give up on her like i was I held on to the concept of hold of I was like, no, I can make this work too long when she was offering me an out to like, we, you can change your class. You can change like you can change it up. It's OK. Like it wasn't until much later. I was like, no, it needs to change so I can enjoy the time that I'm playing. And also like, yeah. And also I would go as far to say sometimes I for if it's a bunch of new people, because I had to with a group of friends I was the person who knew the most but I still didn't know a lot so a bunch of people were trying to make character sheets which is super involved and I would almost say if it's a bunch of new people just give them pre-made character sheets and be like here what like what do you want to do here's a pre-made character sheet because the numbers make sense once you play because they're kind of nonsense before you start playing you're like no 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 it all makes sense later don't worry about it character sheet making is once you get the hang of it, it's super quick and easy. But if you're new making a character sheet, it all seems like nonsense. And it's very overwhelming. Yeah, and once you get the hang of it, you just make all of the characters. Just so many. I was trying to see if I could pull up. Because on Roll20, I had both my old character sheet and my new one that we updated. But I can only get my new one to pull up. I have 20 characters. Holy fuck, on D&D Beyond? Yeah, just for That's funsies. Awesome. Oh, I will say... so. 
meeting in person the role playing i think is much easier meeting in person it's easier to bounce off of people for sure yeah in for person sure. then it makes because especially because you're like i don't when i was i first we start first started doing it online i was like i don't know if people are thinking or if they're just waiting for someone else to do something or they decided their character's not doing anything like i don't know what you're all doing so then i would get nervous and be like i don't know i guess we go do it ah! <laughs> And it makes the, the – once you get the hang of it, it's a little bit easier. But the first couple yeah. times RPing with a new group of people, not seeing them, it's a little harder. Video is almost kind of help, – video helps a bit. And there's – you can use D&D Beyond for your sheets. And Roll20, you can also have your sheets – you can have a character sheet on there, but also maps. So you can move your character around. Yes. D&D Beyond is what helped me – in a big way so and i know we are dice whores and we love the dice but um (laughs) dnd beyond you can have the map built in and for not not for everything so you do have to like keep track of like for my barbarian if i'm raging that's an extra two points of damage that it doesn't calculate when i roll damage um i mean it might update over time and include that but it doesn't right now but Literally, if you're asked to roll initiative, you click the initiative button and it rolls and I got a four initiative. So that's not great, but that's like it rolls for you. Um, And I do that instead of dice because it does the math for you. What I'm trying to do, though, when I roll is to really listen and say like, okay, well, if it's a perception, I click the perception button. It's plus four. I rolled a 10. So it's 14. And it says that really plainly. But if I have something else going on, like if I know that I'm exhausted and I have to, you know, roll at a disadvantage, I think you can do that by right clicking. Yeah. Um, but it's. They added that. Li- I think that wasn't there originally. But very added recently. It so yeah. Nice. But it's it's sort of like the tool is there to like let you be lazy. But it if you use it right, you can also learn a lot with it, which I think is really cool. You're doing. And you're doing the super smart thing because especially if you're a spellcaster, it gives you the briefest. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't always tell you all of it because my friend who's playing the grave cleric, she got super confused because you get a uh, you get two things at first level when you're a grave cleric. You get um, something that it, there's two things to it. That it's two separate paragraphs in the book. But D&D Beyond, the shortened version, just made it look like one sentence and it looks like nonsense. <laughs> So she was she was trying to use something and she kept trying to use like uh to get into specifics, spare the dying pretty much makes it so you you're not rolling death saving throws. And normally it's you have to, it's a touch, you have to be able to touch the person. But for her it's up to 30 feet. She can cast it 30 feet away. And also you can uh you add a bonus to your healing spells if somebody's unconscious. That happens in one in two separate paragraphs, but you get that at level one. In D and D Beyond, it smushes those two things together, and she didn't really know what "spare the dying" was, so she read it like "spare the dying heals you to full health." Oh, is how gotcha. she read that statement because she didn't open it up, and she also didn't. She, she's new to spell casting; she didn't know what "spare the dying" was on its own. So it's kind of like it. It can also super confuse you if you don't entirely know what's going on. It's a lot of reading. You it's a lot like, of rules. It's so much um, reading. But it is, I think, ultimately worth it because you you can get a lot out of the game as it is. And if you're yes. not getting what you want out of it, you can always homebrew. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. As long as you – being vocal, like, don't bitch to the DM, but be honest with the DM about, like, this is kind of frustrating – I'm not sure about this. Like, I don't see how this is. This isn't really working. And be honest, but also don't like this didn't work for me this time. I don't want. I don't want it like this. Like, sometimes the dice don't roll in your favor. I can't use D and D Beyond because the first time I rolled on it, when they first added it, the first three rolls I made in game were all nat ones. So oh, absolutely I don't, not. I don't trust fucking D and D Beyond because it hates me. So I roll <laughs> with my with my thingamabob. I also, think I'll go back to to physical dice eventually because I want to 
I mean, I love them. They're beautiful. And I want to like be able to to manage all of that for my character, not necessarily in my head, but I want to know my character enough to go, okay, I know I roll this many for this attack. And I know that I always have to add this amount. Um, It's just nice having the visual in front of me with with the D&D beyond. But I do eventually want to go back to to rolling dice because I think it's it's a learning tool. Yes. And it's it's also fun to be like, oh, I get to roll six dice right now okay let's see if they fit in my hand shake 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 <laughs> Yay. i got to do i got to do that once with uh my lightning bolt <laughs> i had got was it i had like 60 tens out already and i think it was like 80 10 damage Look. or something that i was doing so i was like excuse me i need to grab more dice and i just we were video chatting at the moment and i just saw my dm go oh shit I did end up killing that thing. It's going down. <laughs> that, was, that was super fun. It's dead but now. yeah, we we always played. Uh, like I said, I never had the the opportunity to join an in person game, so we always played over Skype with either Roll Twenty for the maps, or we used to Theater of the Mind, and we always used our actual dice because the DM was like, "Look, I trust you guys, and I'll be able to tell if you fudge rolls." Because you know, if there are too many successes or too many too many not twenties or something, I'll be able to tell. So, and we appreciated that sense of trust. So we never fudged anything. My I- sister makes us use roll twenty because roll twenty you can also click stuff and it'll mm-hmm. show up in the chat. And my sister, my twin sister. I roll like shit. So I like rolling actual dice so I can punish the dice. I feel like I can punish the dice and help things. It yes. doesn't do anything, but I feel like I can punish my dice. I can't do that on roll 20. But also my twin sister says that she does it. My twin sister rolls super well. I just got the bad end of the spectrum on this. She rolls well. And as a DM, it's very frustrating to be like, fucking A, is that your third nat 20 in this battle alone? The fuck are you doing? And she's like, see, I roll in person. I roll so you guys can see it. It's like, but you're also the DM. You could lie to save us. That's one of the things of being a DM. You can just lie to us. <laughs> we don't know. Just tell us. I have done that. I have done preserve that. Preserve the day. game. Uh, Pre- preserve our rage at you because <laughs> we're just like going, fucking hey, you're murdering us. <laughs> Look, man, I I have done that because I had set up um an appearance for the like big evil bad guy the the end boss basically um but very much in a situation where it was like do not fight this you will die and they engaged in combat so i had to i had i had to intervene i had to fudge some rolls and uh until they they clearly got the picture of oh shit this isn't going to work we should probably run because they would have all died. It would have been a TBK. So yeah, I, I did fudge some rolls there. Because because that would have ended very badly. And both like D&D Beyond and Roll20 have some major, have some issues. I know for um, Roll20, like it doesn't mark your rage as a barbarian. We had a, a first time player play a monk because a monk's a kind of an easier class. And also I made her watch one episode of Critical Role of the new campaign. And she, Beauregard. yeah, she really liked, she was like, that's what I want to do. And I was like, then do it. Yep. Boo. And, and I realized like, oh, I think my character is based off of Twiggy. My bad, but oh, well, <laughs> uh, but I loved her though. She was fun. She's so great. But I'm only realized, on campaign one. <laughs> it's okay. Twiggy's a one time, one time person. Uh, oh, okay. She, uh, but her monks get a thing that if you're not wearing armor, your, your wisdom, your, 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 AC is like your armor class, so how hard it is to hit you. If you're a monk, your wisdom and your dexterity, like it adds multiple things together to equal a different AC, which normally for other classes it won't do. It wasn't doing it for her. And like we were like, your AC is so low, that doesn't make any sense. So we had to go and like she didn't know any better. Like it was her first game. But I had to go in and look at it and be like, okay, you have to manually override it. So it, it does this and this and this. Right. To make it this, it should be this. It's just not doing it. And roll twenty did a thing. A, we haven't had, we haven't gone two or three games in a row where roll twenty hasn't been like, oh, none of you can see the screen. Oh, this is it's broken. So we've like had to cancel games because roll twenty doesn't work. They're but good I'll- tools. They're not something you should rely on completely. Yeah. So it, it's like I'm so glad they're there, but I think it's important to like keep like n- don't 
huh, how do I say do, this without do the being work. preachy? Do, do the, the work. work. But Cause I, but like I'm doing the same thing because I'm still learning, but I'm trying very hard to learn and like using the tools to help me learn, but not using them to be like, all right, well, I can just click this button and it does it for me. You still have to. It's a lot of critical thinking. It's so much. And also like it's it's fun, critical thinking. And also I like I was talking to one of my friends who's who's learning how to play and she's like, whenever we finish a game, I'm just so I'm, my brain is just so on top of shit. I'm so smart. I'm so quick witted after a game because your brain's warmed up. Yeah, <laughs> if that makes sense. You're like, I can do like, oh, yeah, I can, I'm on top of all this shit. It's because it's like doing improv. Cause I told her like, yeah, if you ever do improv, like that's exactly what it's like. You leave an improv thing. And you're like, I am so like I, my brain is peak right now because I'm just aware of all this shit. So you have to pay best. attention. It's the best. It's a lot of listening. It's a lot of listening and it's a lot of follow through in a way that, you know, not only does it make you shine, but it has to make everyone else shine. And that I think is really important that not everyone yes. gets all the time, but it's, it, it you can get there. You can get there. It's not about you. It's about us. That's right. Yep. And I also, you will find, if you play multiple characters, you will find yourself missing the abilities of other characters while you're playing a different character. I was like, fuck, Gilly would know this. Yup. <laughs> Gilly, yep. Gilly, Gilly has a plus nine in this. Fuck. <laughs> Gilly can read thoughts. I miss her. I thought my barbarian had luck for a hot second, but then I remembered it's my <laughs> stout halfling uh, trait. I was like, mm, nope, that's for, that's for Marigold. Um, Do you know how much I've depended my cleric having luck has saved some people because it saves some people. <laughs> I haven't had to use mine yet. It's a different kind of luck. So for stout halflings, it's literally like if I roll a one, then I can yeah. just redo it. But I roll bad, so I need it. <laughs> I've rolled okay with that I, um, character so far. I, I played a character for a while who was a divine soul sorceress. She was a tiefling and her name was Normal. And I got so used to like someone. people calling me normal that would, in another campaign when I wasn't taught, well, I wasn't playing her. Whenever someone like mentioned the word normal, I'd be like, "Yes." Oh wait, no. Just kidding. You just not, you get, not me. You get you get into it. You get into it. It's not the name normal. It's just the word. Do we vaguely want to talk about not vaguely. Do we want to talk about a okay, um let's plays that we enjoy, aka like Critical Role. <laughs> Real yeah, fast. I was going to say we should definitely to to start winding down, we should talk about Ava if you've got any tips for first time DMs and I have a couple like for first time players or new players or any players like Critical Role and some other like podcasts that I would recommend. So, shall we dive into that? Can do. If you're planning, if you're planning to DM cuz if, if you want to start the game, start as a player. That's how you learn. But if at some point you're interested in DMing, um, I haven't done it that often, but I've done it quite a couple of times. I'm also still learning, but here's a few tips from Auntie Ava, my ducklings. Um, if it's your first time in the DM saddle, don't go for a full campaign. Play a couple of one shots instead. See if you like yeah, it. See what your style is. Get to know your players. That is important. Make sure that you know the people uh, that are at the table with you and know. make sure that you know what they want out of the game. So that's another tip. Organize a session zero. Just don't play. Just explain the setting that you want to do. Um, create characters with them and set your basic, your basically make your uh, rules for the table. Like, see what they want to get out of the campaign. Do they want to rely on combat? Do they want more role play? Do they want to mix? Also, set clear boundaries. Because this is a fantasy world. And it can deal with a lot of themes that, you know, come up in fantasy worlds. Or even, you know, ha those that have equivalents in real life. So, make sure that you have clear um, rules about themes that might be triggering or confront confrontational to other people like for instance you know are you okay with mentions of i don't know rape suicide etc if there are people who have a problem with that and it's a hard no then that's fine you take that 
as a DM and you go, I won't put that in the campaign then. You know, it, it's very, very important that you're very clear with your players about what can and can't gel. Like what will and will not fly in the campaign. This goes for them as well. Like as a DM, you are perfectly within your right to to go, I will not tolerate any, uh, you know, sexual overtones. I won't tolerate any bullying. I won't tolerate stuff like that. It is your game. You are entitled to set these rules. Yes, you want your players to have fun, but you want everybody to be comfortable as well. So clear boundaries, set rules, always important. Um. And I think, you know, the most important rule is don't, you know, plan enough, but don't over plan. And I know that sounds complicated, but once you get into it, you will understand because you can plan for days. Your players will still find a way to do exactly the opposite of what you want them to do. (laughs) There will always, always, always be an element of improv involved there will always be times when you're like shit i wanted them to go into the woods but these idiots went into the mountains instead what do i do now it's fine these things happen you know sometimes you're gonna have to make shit up on the fly that's fine and it's not players there's no big deal it's not players versus dm dm versus players dm shouldn't you shouldn't try to be killing your players (laughs) yeah no absolutely not absolutely not But the most important thing, and this is going to be a little segue into our next point. If you watch any actual play podcasts or listen to any actual play podcasts or, you know, if you watch Critical Role, don't try to be Matt Mercer. Nobody's ever going to be Matt Mercer. These are professional actors who do this shit for a living and who have been doing this for years. Yes, they are phenomenal, but they have improv training. And let's play. You can, and let's play podcasts are edited, so they edit out all the like. Also, oh shit! I forgot. Can I do this? Thing? Yeah, they edit that. Mm-hmm. So it's co- cohesive. It's not. <laughs> yeah. So you know, and even with Critical Role at the moment, these people do this for a living. That is literally mostly what of like most of their careers right now is playing D anD D. Like they still have their VO careers, but still, you know, they play a lot of D anD D. So it's expected that they're very, very good at this. Also, they're professional actors. So don't try to make like your first campaign be perfect. You're going to fuck up. Your players are going to fuck up. Everybody's going to fuck up. Just laugh it off and continue. Because, you know, as long as you have fun, you're doing it right. That's basically it. Well said. Thank you. And thanks for those tips. Do you have any uh, one shot recommendations for a first timer? First time DM? Um, well, all of the one shots that I have done, I have put together myself because I I love making puzzles. So uh, one of the one shots that I did was they um, came into a village and there was this uh, there were a bunch of girls who went missing and then there was this fog that covered the town and they couldn't leave the town as long as the fog was up so they had to find out what was causing it and it led them into an old mansion and i basically got to do like the haunted mansion in D &D with like banshees and ghosts and puzzles and i got to do um i got to do a puzzle based off of alice in wonderland i got to do a puzzle based off of uh edgar Allan poe stories it was super super fun but, you know, that's something that I enjoyed. I have never done any pre-made one-shots, but I know that DM's Guild has a lot of them. And if you, like, just Google on the internet, like, D&D one-shots, yeah. you'll find plenty of them. And I think on D&D Beyond, there are a couple of, like, pre-made campaigns that are that are pretty handy to do one-shots with as well. Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe don't start with Curse of Strahd because that one's intense. <laughs> oh my god, um, yes. Is someone in the middle of it? Yes, it is intense. And also it's like an open world option so we you can choose yeah. to go anywhere. And um, yeah. yeah, I think we've been saved a couple uh, okay. times because people, other people in the group have played it before so they have yeah turned it but that's maybe that that's maybe an extra tip. Um, if you're doing a one shot for the first time, like if you're new to DMing, don't be afraid to railroad your players. 
Don't be afraid yes. to, you know, oh, they want to go left. Oh, nope. Tree fell onto the path and you can't go through or, you know, oh, there's been a robbery on that side of the road. The guards won't let you through. Stuff like that. Fudge some rolls if you have to. Put up really high DCs that you know they won't be able to break. If you want, if, you, if you're more comfortable having them stay on the path that you created, just do what you have to do to keep them on that path. That's fine. It's a one shot. You're still learning. Do whatever makes you comfortable. If you're like, I don't want them to get off of this path that I've made. I don't want them to go into a different direction. That's going to give me anxiety. I'm going to panic. That's fine. Keep them on that path. It is your game. You can do what you want. And everybody's learning. So it's okay. All the time. This game is all about just like learning new shit. Indeed. How did you, what are some of the things that helped you learn, Caitlin? I, I honestly think I watched all of Critical Role, the first campaign before I ever tried to play. A, like, I didn't really have any of the books. I knew my sister played and I think she invited me to, there was supposed to be a Pokemon Apocalypse one, like, game that she invited me to that never happened that I still want to happen. Nice. I love the idea so much. But I like I never actually played and then we kind of me and my older sister kind of bullied my twin sister into agreeing to DM. <laughs> <laughs> Cuz we we got the books and I started reading, but I do think a lot of like I consumed well over a hun- hun- over 100 hours of D&D happening in front of me before so some things I knew before going in like okay like it's been brought up like this is a concentration spell so I know I can't cast another concentration spell at the same time because I've heard that be brought up more than a couple I've witnessed somebody misreading spells live on twitch Mm -hmm. recorded so I know not to do that because I saw I saw the mistakes get made in front of me so I know I have to like read the spells Watching other people play has made me a better player in that very specific way. Like I, 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 before it felt so daunting to like be prepared and like you felt like you had to read everything, which I mean, you kind of do, but it's, it helps to know what to look for and what to read for. Like, oh, it's a concentration spell. That means if I cast another concentration spell, then this one goes away. It's, you know, you pick up those types of tips, which is really helpful. And I also, I, I read, the, I read the book and then I also like when I started, when I knew I was going to be a sorcerer, I, and also because th- these were a bunch of people who've played before. So they were like, we're just going to jump to level five and do not do this. And I was like, I've never played this class before. I don't know. So I went online and I just searched like good sorcerer spells to, and then I read what people had to say about what things to take for a sorcerer. I took some of that info and went, nah because like some of the stuff because i'm a divine soul sorcerer so i get cleric spells along with my sorcerer spells and i was and you get like meta magic so i can do some fun things as a sorcerer but i remember i looked up some stuff about which meta magic should i pick and there was a, a list that said don't use distance that's nonsense but i was like but as a cleric as a divine soul thing i can uh, distance a touch spell that is a healing spell called cure wounds instead of a touch spell that can now become a 30 feet and I can now uh, heal you from 30 feet away which normally I would have to be super close to you so this list said it's nonsense but I took that critically and went not for what I'm doing and didn't agree with the list so I also, yeah I go- the player I go- guides I- yeah. I've been looking at player guides for my druid which is like my more complicated character and some of the advice that they give in terms of like you'll never use this well I've already used it a couple times it depends on the character it depends on how you play it depends on your dm it depends on the style of your adventure you never know and that's what's so great about it like you can be creative to a point um with the spells and abilities that you have like for example like create water is a spell that certain classes have Mm -hmm. create water doesn't mean i attack with water but it could mean that like okay you make this creature wet and that harms them or you that's a really bad example um (laughs) or you you, do what ava's uh player did i'm just gonna drown this 
creature right because it's a cube inside of it so right so you can when it's not an attack there are ways to creatively make that happen the dm has to be cool with it and okay with it and able to think on the fly and and honor that as an action but you can make stuff work and it's and it's about like that push and pull with a dm that shouldn't be a you know a, a negative a thing it's yeah, not, it's a, not fight. a fight it's just a hey is this a thing I, it's also good to be like i want to do this is this possible yes before you i just ask say, so I'm, many questions i'm attacking and i'm doing this and i assume it's gonna work because if then you kind of wasted a thing it's always good to be like i want to this is the flavor i'm going for but there's always a so like read like read what your player can do there's also stuff online where you can just you don't have to necessarily have the books you can kind of look most of the stuff up online but there's online resources all over the place but always take the these are the best things to do for your class with a grain of salt use them but you don't have Mm -hmm. to they're not exactly right for your character maybe so it's use them as resources and intake it but you don't have to use it so one of the the learning tools that i really recommend um it's not Dungeons and Dragons specifically, it's another uh, role-playing system called GURPS, and I always forget what GURPS stands for, but it's an acronym. You can Google it, G-U-R-P-S. Um, R-P-S is role-playing system, and I forget what the G-U stands for, but um, the podcast, the film Reroll, is Ooh, one yeah, of the first- fun, fun Yes, one of the first shows that I got into that was role-playing because I was into it from the um, the- the improv aspect um but on that show they they do they take films and the dm or the gm they call it a gm in this game system the gm paolo usually paolo but sometimes other people um takes a movie and breaks it down into encounters basically and and they re-roll the film so if you've seen the movie um thelma and louise you know spoiler alert jump ahead 30 seconds at the end of the movie they drive off a cliff and like that's the end of the movie in the film re-roll version of it they rolled the dice and ended up with a completely different ending so another spoiler alert for the movie speed it's that one with like sandra bullock and (laughs) keanu reeves and like in the on the bus on the bus right and in the beginning of the movie the part that like nobody remembers there's this like elevator scene where two of the main characters have to like you know save some people from an elevator in the film re-roll version they only got to that point and then they died (laughs) so it's so funny and like the girl who was going to be sandra bullock's character was just like well it's been fun guys (laughs) they never got to her so it's the sort of thing the Jumanji movie, which they anticipated oh my to God. be the most, they were like, "This is gonna go off the rail." Like, this is gonna. Everybody be- rolled so well in the Jumanji movie, and Paolo was so mad because he's like, <laughs> "I built a whole system, and everybody's fine, <laughs> and everyone's alive." So thanks, they guys. Didn't even, they didn't even make it to the '90s because they just like they rolled to the point where like yeah. they dealt with it in the original, in the original, in the pre the, in the timeline. Yeah, the with intro. Alan Parrish. Oh, oh no. my God. It's so good, though. Like, but that really helped me kind of understand, like, okay, these are, you know, you're playing through a set of crossroads, a set of decisions. You get to this point in the story, the GM is kind of guiding um, up until that point. It's sort of like a lesson in creative railroading, almost. It's like, here's the scene, we're setting the scene, we're letting the characters do what they want. The actors on that show are kind of advised to, like, understand the character and their motivations, but not necessarily stick to what they did in the movie but to go off of like what that character would have done in the moment um and it's a really great education in like character work but also like cooperative storytelling so that's aside from critical role which of course is the mecca um the film re-roll podcast is the one that i'd recommend to like kind of immerse yourself in that world of okay i'm in- i'm playing a character and and mathematically deciding what to do next I'm going to add in one more because this one's this one's yeah. not quite as long because both Critical Role and uh, ro- uh, Film Reroll are kind of on the longer side. Dimension 20 has uh, some good D&D podcasts. They're very – because Critical Role is very serious. They're very – like, it's it's funny. They have a good time, but they, yes. they like – I've cried multiple times serious. watching yeah. Critical Role. <laughs> 
and but uh, that show broke me. Ugh, Dimension 20 is a little it's a little on the sillier side. It's a different style of DMing. It's not in any way like worse. There's no like bad DM. I don't want it like this DM is better than this DM, but uh, I think his name is Brendan. He's super good and it's just super nonsense. All these kids have daddy issues and half the time if they roll bad, they're like, "You think this guy this guy might be your dad? You don't know." Oh no. no. <laughs> and it's the kids from it's all the uh, people from College Humor. Like from a couple years ago. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of people you know. Like you, if you've seen any college humor skit, you've seen some of these people. But it is them playing Dungeons and Dragons, and it is it's entertaining and it's fun. And they also get stuff wrong, but they amend it. They're like, "We did this wrong. We're fixing it. It's fine." So. Well, I did put the film reroll on my podcast list, so I think I'll be checking that out. And what was the other one? Dimension Twenty. Dimension Twenty, which you can actually watch. It's on YouTube. Oh, sweet. Let's out link it. I do like when you're able to watch because I like seeing the I, facial expressions on the I like watching. I tried just straight up listening to Critical Role when it first came to podcast form. I tried. I tried, but you could tell you were missing stuff. stuff from, yeah. And I've told like everybody that I've tried to get into it, I'm like, I know you want to just listen to it, but you are. it's meant to be watched. It's filmed, and then yeah. they ripped the audio from the Twitch stream. So... Please. Yeah, sometimes it's just for like the dumb shit that they do at the table, even when they're not in character. Oh like God. if Laura has donuts and Travis tries to steal one, she's just like, "I know I'm married to you, but I will beat you up if you take my donut." And that's just the kind of thing you don't get in the audio. Or Marisha it's- and Talzin will be talking, and Travis will be like throwing stuff at them to make them uh-huh. stop yep. talking. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. It's just it, it's nice too because so like with quarantine and working from home my eyes have been bugging me a bunch so I do watch it like I have it in the background a lot but sometimes like especially in those times when it gets serious and Matt is on like a monologue of like explaining some exposition or setting the scene Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. he's he's playing as a a non-player character who's like explaining some like really intense plot point you can close your eyes and see all of it he is so talented Yes. He's an amazing storyteller. They all are. I want him to describe yep. every chair so I can, like, I don't know which <laughs> chair I want, Matt. Can you just describe each one so I yep. can try to figure out which chair I want in my home? Thank you. I, I would like him to be my seeing eye person, like, if I ever go blind, <laughs> which is likely at this yep. point. Just, just Matt Mercer, lead me through the world. Or I've You also know that? Had... Have you guys ever seen the movie uh, Amélie? Oh, yeah, with uh, uh, the French one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what it is. I've never seen yeah, it with, all the way through. Yeah, with Audrey Tattoo. There's a scene in there where um, she there's a blind man that she always sees on the street. And there's a scene where she like grabs him by the arm and she just like takes him around town and she just describes everything like there's a there's the butcher and there's rotisserie chickens in the window and there's a dog watching the rotisserie chickens and a baby watching the dog watching the rotisserie chickens and we're moving on and then there's this shop and she describes it everything like she describes everything to him and then she's like oh we're at the station i'm gonna leave you here have a good day and then she's gone and then she's just standing there with this big smile on his face and like this this like aura of color around him like he can Mm -hmm. see it all and that's just what I imagine that it is like if Matthew Mercer describes something to you. It's just like, yes, I can see it. I've also had moments Also, where I, I would listen to him narrate the phone book. I would too. I've also had moments where I forgot Matt. I was like, you know, Matt hasn't like spoken like almost in for an hour. And I was like, oh, wait, no, Matt was three of the characters they talked to. Yeah. I just didn't think about it <laughs> because he can do all the voices, which. Okay, okay, okay. But, but, but. Listen, if you want Matt at peak Matt Mercer, if you want to see how fucking talented he is, go to YouTube, uh, Google Critical Role Victor. You don't even need to know anything oh, about Critical Role. <laughs> just just look it up and you will see how talented that man is. He That is one of my favorite NPCs. He even did a voice pack. There's um there's this tool called Sirenscape that you can use to put like background music in your campaigns and uh, uh, sound effects. And he made a voice pack as Victor for Sirenscape with like these little little throwaway lines for like a shopkeeper or whatever. Oh so if you want to put Victor in your game, you have lines for him. What a gem! It's 
the best. I fucking have you encountered Victory? I there? have. I so we're in the Fey Wild right now in campaign Ooh, one. Yeah. So we've been to Victor a couple times. Um yeah. and just and Talison does half the work too because he's playing such a good yeah. straight man of yeah, like such a um, good, he's a, Wow, okay. please don't blow up. Okay. Um uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I just mm-hmm. they're all so good, but Mercer is ah uh, it it makes me miss theater and being in shows really, like yeah, yeah, yeah. this is my my closest reach to like acting and playing pretend and improving and i mean it's i'm in two campaigns right now one of them's once a week one of them's nearly once a week and they are my absolute like safe havens in this whole experience yeah. it's been the best and they each i have get that because good... the only chance that i have sorry go ahead I was... they each have like uh different aspects of what makes them such good players at the table also like they are very good at like not meta gaming at all. Like they are very strict on themselves of like, I wouldn't know that. So I guess I'm just going to, sorry, like I'm going to hurt myself doing something. Me, the care, the person knows, but yeah. Scanlon doesn't know this. So I'm just, yeah. I'm going to do it. And that makes it, that makes it work. That makes it real. If you're butthurt about like, Oh, well, I didn't want to do that. Like that's, that has happened with some of the people I've played with. But once you get past that, once you really play into like what it is, like I almost love when I roll low because it's like we just did a. It's our, funny. <laughs> our fantastic, fantastic DM, um, not Steve. I mean, Steve's a fantastic DM, but our very creative. It's our other one. Steve's a great DM, but um, he will agree that our DM Bill is he's an actor. So he he very much plays in like the mind puzzles and the improving and um, our group recently he he made an encounter that he called well 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 and oh, no. we came upon three wells a well next to a well next to another well <laughs> and it had a puzzle and a and a riddle that one of our uh, players had to solve um, but the reward was an immovable rod which um, I was thrilled because I encountered it in our game and then got to the part uh, in campaign one of critical role where they used it inside a dragon, the immovable rod. Um, but it's, it's an item that basically you click a button and it can't be moved unless you roll like a crazy high strength roll. Um, so I, as the barbarian was like, I want to, I want to try to fuck this thing up. I want to like, cause I didn't know, like my character didn't know the secret. Like, oh my God, this is magic. I got to figure this out. I'm going to push really hard. And I'm like rolling and rolling and trying to like, like make this thing move. Um, and I got really close to, to rolling it, but I had a point of exhaustion. So I just couldn't get it. And it was like one of the funniest, like back and forths I've had with the other players in that campaign. It was, oh, it was so good. There was a game where my gnome ranger, we were in the sewers for some reason. And I have a pretty high athletics because like I've like she's a ranger. She's pretty good at like doing stuff. I managed to I was the only one who fell into the sewer multiple times. I everyone else managed to like jump across, but my little gnome kept falling in and falling in and falling in to the point everyone's just like again. I was like, I don't know. She just keeps Falling it like every like it was about five times I think oh, it was, so, but it did lead also like eventually like when we leveled up I could take a feat and I took a feat that was like I get advantage on athletic on these I get a I get to roll twice and take the higher number on these certain rolls and I can be like it's because she fell into the stupid sewer multiple times and she's not gonna do that again. Yeah, low rolls so can be good. Fun. Low rolls can be fun. I really want to roll a character that's like and play it very high charisma, but have a very low charisma skill, like someone who's very overconfident in their ability to like charm people, but who is just terrible at it, like a Zap Brannigan type of character. Oh, God, yes, please do. That's next on my list. Do you guys want to play one shot together? Yes, very much. Wait, it took like. Would an- you like me to run one for it took you? Almost two hours for her to ask. This was actually. A I know, right? <laughs> Thank God. First of all, yes. Oh yeah. But second of all, I would love to like 
try a DM try to DM one for you guys because I'm th- I'm sitting here thinking like all right I can't DM one for our friends because Steve's already DMing one for our friends I want to really get my feet wet what group would be accepting and loving for me to try my first campaign oh right my under the plumb bob girls of course so uh, I'm down we here for you and uh yeah, listeners and if you have questions Oh, absolutely. We can help. And listeners, if that's something you're interested in, let us know. Um, you're listening to this because you're a Simizen on our Patreon. So uh, I could see us uh, doing some more D&D content. Um, or we just do it on our own and we tell you a little bit about it afterwards. But uh, either way, big yes from me. Big ol' yes. Then let's do this. Let's let's get let's get one going. Hell yeah. How do you want to do this, Ava? <laughs> yes. Oh, man. I think I already know what character I want to play. I'm so I excited. Use, I I haven't done a fighting character yet, so I can, I'm can. i actually pretty good at spells and doing the nuance of spells, but fighting, I don't know how to punch anybody in D&D. <laughs> Everyone's like, it's so easy. And I'm like, I don't fucking know. What do I, what do I roll? <laughs> I've always wanted to play this character who's just, like, completely normal. Who's just, like, living their normal life, like, working in a shop or a tavern or whatever, and just got dragged into this whole adventure shit. And it's just constantly, like, like Dante from Clerks, like, I'm not even supposed to be here. I don't know what's going on. The unwilling you know? NPC. That's so funny. Yeah, pretty much. I'm from like, both I my just, pa- I just will- Both my parents are alive. Um, I'm, I was just, yeah. I top of my No class. tragedy. Yeah, I'm fine. I had a normal childhood. I have a job. Like, I just want to pay my taxes on time. That's all. I don't really. What's a mimic? I don't know. Just that type of character, I think, would be really funny. A st- straight man to the nonsense. Indeed. Yep. How do we wrap this up? I mean, I think we just do the sound of, of dice hitting a table and oh, tell everyone okay. to, oh, to, to, to listen. listen. Do you want the table or do you want my dice uh, box? My dice box will keep them contained. Shaky, shaky. Do that. Ready? 